because we all know that role of splints and traction has reduced with increased usage of internal fixation. But what and why do we need to know? Uh, because to learn the basics of splints and tractions and uh, apply them correctly in emergency scenario to know the appropriate tractions to be used where internal fixation is contraindicated and definitely to pass the board rounds table by board during the exam. So uh, splints, uh, I believe uh, everyone can understand that it is an appliance or object used to immobilize or hold the position uh, of an injured part of the body uh, to protect the injured bone, soft tissue, reduce pain, swelling and muscle spasms. And the purpose of the splint is to provide immobilization, use for transportation, use for traction, to help reduce pain in acute condition. Therapeutic use, definitely deformity correction like Dennis Brown splint or a prevention of deformity like cock up splint in a radial nerve palsy. So the prime indication for the usage of splint is fracture, sprain and dislocation in acute conditions, joint infections, acute arthritis or gout, or acute tenosynovitis. And uh, definitely we are not going to use a splints in cases of compartment syndrome, when there is a need for open reduction is definite, or there is infected skin condition when we cannot examine the skin under the splint. Coming to splint types, there are two types, mainly the unconventional one, which we are going to use at home, or in the, at roadside and there are conventional ones which are basically the POP splint, Thomas splints which are available in the hospital. So these are the example of unconventional uh, splints as you can see there is a hockey stick or umbrella tied to the leg to support it and the types of conventional splints can be a wooden splint, metallic splints like Kramer wire, Thomas splint or a BB splint, plaster splints, pneumatic splints, vacuum splints or miscellaneous. So this is one of the most commonly used wooden st splint known as Liston's long split, a sp a splint. And it is a simple straight wooden splint, primarily used for fractures and dislocations around hip, shaft of femur, and around the knee joint. And the extent of this splint is lower boundary of the groin to the three inches below the sole of the foot. And the precautions, definitely you need to take care of the bony prominences that, that is greater trochanter, malleolus, and the head of the fibula. And the common complication, if you are not taking care of these complications and precautions, is common peroneal nerve palsy. So this is a picture showing a, a Liston's splint, wooden splint, and this is a clinical photograph of the same uh, usage. Coming to Kramer wire splint, temporary splintage of the fracture during transportation it is used. It is made up of thick parallel metallic galvanized interlacing wires. And if you can see in the figure, the inner surface is concave to accommodate the bulge of the limb. It can be bent into different shapes in order to immobilize different parts of the body. This is a, a example shown to you, a clinical picture and the x-ray of the same patient, a clinical picture while applying the Kramer wire and the x-ray of the same patient. The advantage of the Kramer wire is moldable and fits all the sizes and shape of the limb. It can be autoclaved also. But the disadvantage is that it does not provide rigid immobilization and it can uh, create uh, radio opaque shadows and uh, minute fractures can miss out due to it. Uh, it is usually used most commonly nowadays as a replacement to the wooden splints. This is a Thomas splint. It is the most important splint as far as exam is concerned. Uh, the first and foremost question is devised by H.O. Thomas initially for TB in 1875. And it is used for fracture shaft of femur in children also and adults, fracture interrochantric femur and immobilization after reduction of dislocations of hip. There are three major parts. One is the oval metallic padded ring, which rests on the ischial tuberosity and anterior superior iliac spine. The parallel bars, inner and the outer bars. The ring has an angle of 120 degree to the inner bar. The two side bars joined at the distal end, as visible in the picture, to form a W over which the traction can be applied. And the outer bar angled out 5 cm below the ring, that is, it has a bend to accommodate the greater to handle, as visible in the picture. So the right way to choose a Thomas splint, again a question asked in the exam is that you have to measure the oblique circumference of the thigh immediately below the gluteal fold that equals the internal circumference of the padded ring. But if your measurement measuring from the normal limb, then you have to add two inches to the diameter for accommodation of the swelling. 
Measure the distance from the crotch to the heel and add six to nine inches. This will give you the length of the inner bar of the Thomas splint. So uh, the basics of the Thomas splint preparation is that you have to fashion the slings between both the bars. Cut a wide domit bandage of six wide inches. Uh, pass the bandage over the inner and the outer bars and then fasten the two ends under the outer bar as shown in the figure. And the distal sling must end 6 cm above the heel, definitely to prevent the sore on the tendo Achilles. If you can see in the figure, proximal sling leaves behind a triangular area of the thigh unsupported. And to avoid that, it is avoided by passing a bandage around the ring as well as the side bars. Alright, so you have to prepare like this. This is a figure just to show you that you have to first uh, domit bandages are used then the cotton, then you have to thread the Thomas splint on the limb and then you have to tie it properly. And this is a final picture showing how a Thomas splint is used in the patient. What are the precautions? The adequate padding of the ring and the bony prominences is must. And you have to position the limb, especially if you are dealing with the proximal fractures, in flexion and abduction to counter the muscul muscular forces on the proximal fragment and prevent coxa vera as shown in the figure. It can be used as fraction splint also described later. Coming to the another important splint which is there uh, kept in the exam is a bowler brown splint. Bowler modification of the brown splint which had only one pulley. And now after the modification, it consists of heavy metallic frame with three or four pulleys performing different functions. Usually used for comminuted trochanteric fracture of the femur, fracture sharp femur, supracondylar femur, fracture shaft of the tibia and fibula, and fracture proximal tibial plateau. What are the advantages of bowler brown splint? As you can see, there are different pulleys. You can uh, put a traction from using these pulleys, making this device a self-contained easy option. Limb kept in the comfortable position and elevated position so that the swelling can be reduced. Angle of the traction can be changed from one pulley to the other. Wound care is possible and multi-purpose application uh, I am going to discuss this bowler brown splint a bit detail uh, also during the traction. Coming to another splint of the lower limb is a congenital dislocation hip splint known as Von Rosen splint. It is H shaped as visible in the picture. Hip should be properly reduced before it is splinted. Hip held in flexion and abduction. Extreme position avoided and uh, joint allowed uh, some movement in the splint as shown in the figure. Dennis Brown splint has already been covered by the Kapoor sir, so I am just skipping this off. Uh, Use in the club foot. Coming to the plaster splints, uh, these are just the example to show how the plaster splints looks like. But for exam purpose, you can be shown this POP on the table viva, and you can be asked the formula which is hemihydrate calcium sulfate. And the commercial POP rolls usually have a muslin stiffened by the starch. POP powder and an accelerator substance like L. And there are other ready-made splinting materials apart from POP like plaster OCL or a fiberglass commonly known as a scotch cast. The benefit of a scotch cast is it cures rapidly, less messy, stronger, lighter and less moldable. And the disadvantage is a scotch cast is more expensive and more difficult to mold. POP is an ideal spl splint as it is cheap, easy to mold, strong light, easy to remove, permeable to radiography, permeable to air and not inflammable. And how it works? When wet, it crystallizes, it uh, becomes hot and produces an exothermic reaction. Average setting time is 3 to 9 minutes, often asked in the examination, and average drying time is 2 to 3 days. All right. Coming to the disadvantage of POP, more difficult to apply, gets soggy and soft when it gets wet. There are three types of plaster splints which you can apply on a patient. One is cast, which is encircles the circumference. One is spica, when it immobilizes the limb with the trunk or spine. And the slab, when it covers only one surface of the limb. Slab, as the name suggests, it is a temporary splint. Initially, uh, initial stages of fracture treatment and during uh, first aid immobilizes the limb post-operatively and infections. It is made up of half by the POP and half by the bandage roll and hence can easily accommodate the swelling. Coming to cast, POP roll can completely encircle the limb 
definitive form of fracture treatment and correction of the deformity and can be applied by three methods one is directly applying on the skin known as a skin tight cast next is known as bologna cast over which you apply the pop encircling around the cotton and third is a three tier cast in which the stockiness is stockinet is used first followed by the cotton padding this classification can be asked in the examination Coming to the spica, as we know that it encircles a part of the body, spine and the limb and the common spica is the hip spica. Hip spica is commonly used in the lower limb for treatment of fracture sharp femur in children and young adults once the fracture becomes sticky and circles one or both the legs and the chest or the trunk. Generally strengthened with the reinforcement bar as shown in the figure. This is a reinforcement bar between the two hip spicas. You can see this is also known as knicker spica. It looks like a short, short leg hip spica when it is above the knee on both the sides. This is bilateral long hip spica, two hip spica. This is one and one half hip spica, one and a half hip spica. This is a terminology. Cast trimmed at the anal and the genital region to allow the passage of the urine and the stool. This is a hip spica children uh, example. And this is a triangle which is a weakest part, portion of the hip spica, commonly known as immature corner, commonly asked in the wards round. Coming to the complications of POP, due to the tight fit, a POP can lead to pain, pressure sore, compartment syndrome, peripheral nerve injury due to compression or cast syndrome. Due to improper application, it can lead to joint stiffness, plaster blisters and sores, breakage due to plaster allergy, allergic dermatitis. Cast fracture or uh, cast disease or fracture disease is manifested as muscle atrophy, osteoporosis, joint stiffness, muscle weakness, skin breakdown, compartment syndrome. So commonly asked question, what is fracture disease? So you have to answer like this. Coming to some of the three commonly used splints made up of plasters uh, in lower leg. One of the commonly used splint is a short leg posterior splint and usually applied slightly distal to the most prominent point of the digits on the plantar aspect, bending posteriorly around the heel and terminating distally 2 to 3 inches below the popliteal fossa as shown in the figure. Posterior ankle splint, it is used commonly in distal tibial or fibular fracture, reducing dislocations, severe sprains and tarsal or metatarsal fractures. Use at least 12 to 15 layers of the plaster placed from the metatarsal heads on the plantar surface of the foot and extends up to the back of the leg to the level of the fibular neck. And you have to understand that if we add a cooptation splint to this posterior ankle splint, it eliminates the inversion and eversion potential of the ankle and this is known as stirrup splint used in ankle sprains. As you can see, this stirrup splint is the third, is the second most common splint asked in the exam. This splint should be long enough involving the leg from below the medial side of the knee and wrap around under the surface of the heel and back up to the later side of the same knee. So medially and laterally. Apart from the posterior splint, one more splint is added from the medial to the lateral side. This makes the stirrup splint or a sugar, sugar tongue splint or a bulky Jones splint. Then a long leg splint is definitely it is longer than the short leg and the terminally distal extent is 2 to 3 inches just below the gluteal sulcus or the fold of the buttock as shown in the figure and it is utilized in the high tibial or fibular fractures when they are about to unite tibial plateau fractures and knee injuries and fractures. This is an example of high tibial splint. These are other knee splints like cylindrical splints or prefabricated splints available in the market. This is another splint used for the phalangeal fractures, commonly known as body strapping. Fractured toe secured to the adjacent toe with the tape. Use a small piece of bedding and place between the injured toe. Then there are splints uh, not commonly used in the examination like air splint. It provides less support used for ankle sprain rather than any other fractures or dislocation used to prevent eversion and uh, inversion injuries. Usually it becomes rigid when filled with the air, limit motion, control bleeding or swelling, injured part uh, inserted into the deflated splint and then the air is infused and the splint molds, molds according to the injured part. Filled to the point which allows indentation with the finger tips. Then 
one is a uh, one is a splint which is the air splint in which we are pulling pushing in the air the another splint is a vacuum splint in which we are we are taking off the air it is a styrofoam chips contained inside an air tight cloth pliable sleeves mold to the shape of the injury using a hand held pump to draw out the air from within the sleeves this is a example shown in the figure advantages ability to provide uh, support while relieving the pressure at the injured site uh, it works similar to the vac ability to conform to any shape and uh, x ray uh, can be done with the splint in c2 so we can just skip with the care of the patient on the splint but we should check padding over the fracture site prominence and uh, we should encourage active toe movements and keep an eye over the danger site of the compartment syndrome so the most important pre and post checks with the splints are the mnemonic is facts you should check for the function you should check for the arterial pulsation capillary refill temperature and sensation you should remember this mnemonic facts coming to tractions we all know the traction the appliances of a force uh, it is the application of a force to stretch certain part of the body in a specific direction it can be short term or long term what are the advantages to relieve the pain due to muscle spasms to restore and maintain the alignment of the bone to help restore blood flow and nerve function to allow treatment and dressing of the soft tissue to rest injured or the inflamed joints to allow movement of the joint during fracture healing and to gradually correct deformity due to contracture of the soft tissue providing tamponade to the bleeding vessels this is a example shown how the traction can reduce the fracture you can see a pin here in the bone uh, which is providing that traction this is a traction suspension system which uh, includes all those things like balkan frame uh, different types of splints slings pad traction different types of bowler stirrup cords pulleys weights and a constant nursing care this is just an example to show you how the counter traction works and when you lift the uh, one end of the uh, frame this is a shock block elevator and this is a uh, pull of the counter traction and body weight of the patient directed towards the bed this is a balkan frame commonly seen in the orthopedic ward these are the bars for the traction and these are the monkey grips which are used for pelvic lifting exercises this is balkan frame commonly used in the ward rounds the type of traction on the basis of application uh, can be manual skin traction or skeletal traction shown in the figure coming to the skin traction it is used as a definitive method of treatment as well as first aid or temporary measure this is a example of the skin traction in this the traction force is applied over a large area this is spreads the <clears throat> this is spreads the load and is more comfortable and efficient force applied is transmitted from skin to the bone via superficial fascia deep fascia and intermuscular septa for better efficiency the traction force is applied only to the limb distal to the fracture weight skin damage can result from too much of the traction so the maximum weight recommended for skin traction is 15 pounds that is for the adhesive skin traction and weight is usually determined by age bone quality and body habitus of the patient adhesive skin traction you have to prepare the skin by the shaving and washing and applying the tincture benzoin and uh, which protects the skin from uh, abrasions and act as an additional adhesive avoid placing the adhesive strapping over the bony prominences and protect by the cotton leave a loop of 5 cm projecting beyond the distal end of the limb to allow movement of the finger and foot one of the most important question asked in the exam is the application of the two straps of the skin traction note that the lateral side the strapping lies lie slightly behind the uh, line parallel to the lateral malleolus and greater trochanter the lateral side is below and the medial side is up this will protect the external rotation of the foot and hence in turn protect the common peroneal nerve palsy non adhesive skin traction used in thin and atrophic skin this consists of length of soft ventilated latex foam rubber laminated into a strong cloth backing as the grip is less secure frequent reapplication will be required in the ward and the traction weight is also less which is only 4.5 kg in comparison to the adhesive skin traction 
this is just a way told to you uh, shown to you that you have to apply the foam and then you have to uh, wrap the bandage over the foam and this is the right way and this is the wrong way and this should be the final picture of the skin traction Contraindication definitely when you have abrasion and laceration of the skin you cannot use it if you have varicose vein or impending gangrene if you have dermatitis or if there is marked shortening of the bony fragment when the weight uh, which you are applying of with the skin traction is insufficient so you have to move to the next traction which is skeletal traction and these are the complication of skin traction which is allergic reaction blister formation compartment syndrome from over tight wrap and peroneal nerve palsy for which you have to maintain that uh, what i have told you the alignment of the two straps common skin traction we are just going to see skeletal traction just the uh, we know that we have to put the pin in the bone traction force is applied directly to the bone by means of pin or the wire most commonly used pins are steelman pin denim pin or ky wire steelman pin is uh, described along with the stirrup bowler stirrup in 1929 this is a steelman pin one uh, one end is sharp and the other end is blunt this is often kept in the examination and this is a bowler stirrup and this is how it is attached together and the steelman pin is inserted in the uh, tibia or the femur denim pin is uh, usually used in cancellous or osteoporotic bone as it has threads in between the uh, pin as you can see there are threads and these threads engage the bone all right so th this is a difference between the denim and the steelman pin this is the threads shown kushner prior is usually of a small diameter and insufficient rigidity Uh, usually used in smaller bones like pediatric bones where you cannot use a steelman pin or a denim pin and usually used with k wire strainer uh, to tension the wire all right so this is a k wire which is has a sharp end stroke art at both ends uh, this is uh, used with a k wire strainer or the other name is bow or the tensioner all right so uh, common sites of skeletal traction are these sites upper tibial is the most common site and usually the pin is inserted from the lateral to the medial side to avoid the peroneal palsy in young patient we should avoid the open physis and the usual landmark is 2.5 cm posterior and distal to the tibial tubercle uh lower end of the femur is another area which uh, uh, you are going to put the pin but the prolonged traction on the lower end of the femur uh, usually provides knee stiffness and it should be removed after 2 to 3 weeks pin insertion point can be determined by various ways and one of the way is 3 cm above the knee joint or you are going to take a line in the knee extended from the patella and from the fibular head and the line where it is in intersecting that is the right place all right the other common locations are lower end of the tibia or the calcaneum calcaneum the point of insertion is usually 2 cm below and behind the lateral malleolus and it is advantageous in traction forces directly in life of line of calf muscle and counteract their pulls disadvantage if not properly put it can lead to subtalar joint stiffness infection and flippant loosening this is a safe zone of the calcaneum pin this is upper end of the femur uh, traction usually the lateral femoral traction we have to put the pin here which is 2.5 cm below the uh, greater to canter tip all right so this is the uppermost part of the gt and distal to 2.5 cm you have to put this pin application on the g or la the most important ask uh, uh, thing in the exam is if you are asked about the procedure is hold the limb in the same degree of lateral rotation as a normal limb and with the ankle at the right angle you you don't have to keep the limb perpendicular to the bed you have to keep it in the same degree of lateral rotation identify the site of the insertion hold the pin horizontally at the right angle to the long axis of the limb and you have to avoid and muscles and the tendons all right so this is how you have to uh, and always use a hand drill and not the power drill to uh, insert the pin complications uh, introduction of the infection into the bone incorrect placement of the pin can allow the pin to cut out of the bone makes control of the rotation of the limb difficult makes application of the splint difficult and unequal pull causes pin to move last traction forces can cause distraction at the fracture site 
ligament damage and can lead to damage to the epiphyseal growth plate in the children. Some skeletal tractions are this uh, role of counter traction. Counter traction is a force acting in the opposite direction of the applied traction. And on the basis of counter traction, uh, there are two types of traction. One is a fixed traction and slight interaction. Fixed traction when the counter traction acts through an appliance like Thomas splint, which obtains a purchase on the part of the body. Hence, counter traction is obtained by applying force against the fixed point of the body proximal to the attachment of the muscles in a spaz. Examples like fixed traction with the Thomas splint or a Roger Anderson well left traction. So, uh, in this uh, used to maintain the reduction, not to obtain the reduction, especially in cases of fracture sharp femur can be used with skin or skeletal traction. This is an example. You can see that the counter traction force is applied by the ring of the thomas when it is uh, pushing hard against the ischial tuberosity. And again, another question asked, if you can appreciate the cords, on the medial side, the cords are beneath the bar, and on the lateral side, the cords are over the bar, again, to provide some internal rotation of the limb to provide any pressure on the external area that is on the common peroneal nerve, all right? Benefits of the fixed traction, definitely apparatus is self-contained and uh, does not uh, need the gravity. Best technique for transportation of the patient, less chances of distraction, delayed union or non-union. Fixed traction, fixed skeletal traction and fixed traction with the plaster commonly known as Tobruk splint, commonly named after the place of Tobruk splint which usually uh, is done in the uh, World War II and uh, plaster is applied over the thomas. This is a Charlie's traction unit uh, for the treatment of fracture sharp fever consists of upper tibial steamen pin incorporating in a below knee cast which is then fit into a Thomas splint. Use the advantage of this is compression of the tissue of the upper calf including common peroneal nerve does not occur so the palsy chances reduces. Equinus deformity of ankle doesn't occur. Tendo Achilles is protected. Rotation of the foot and the distal treatment is controlled. A fracture of the epsilator tibia can be treated conservatively, simultaneously. Then the Roger Anderson well left traction is originally used in management of fracture pelvis. But nowadays, skeletal traction being applied to the injured leg, while the well leg, the normal leg was also applied for the counter traction. Nowadays, this method is valuable in correcting the abduction and adduction deformity. If you can see, with the abduction deformity at the hip, the applied limb appears to be longer and you, uh, the, uh, when the traction is applied to the well leg and the affected limb is simultaneously pushed up, the abduction deformity is reduced. So, uh, this is uh, the adduction deformity and this is the abduction deformity. So, there is apparent lengthening in the abduction deformity. So, this apparent lengthening is visible here. So, in the well leg traction, you put a traction on the well leg and on the, no and the affected leg, you put a counter traction. And this is applied using this apparatus. If you can see this apparatus, you apply a plaster cast, above knee plaster cast on the limb which will be pushed up. Alright? So, in abduction deformity, it is a diseased limb. And large step stirrup down this and you are going to use this stirrup to pull one leg and push the other leg. Slight interaction when the weight of all or the part of the body acting under the influence of gravity is utilized to provide the counter traction. Principle of slight interaction, the traction force is applied by the weight attached to the adhesive strapping or a steel pin by a cord acting over a pulley. Counter traction is obtained by raising one end of the bed by means of wooden blocks so that the body tends to slide in the opposite direction. It means the body weight is acting as a counter traction force. Coming to few specific tractions, last part of the uh, presentation, coming to one of the most commonly asked questions, uh, you are going to face this skin traction in the ward rounds, simple horizontal traction described by Bucks in 1861, similar to Pope's traction used in temporary management of the femoral neck fracture, femoral sharp fracture, undisplayed fracture of estabulum, in place of pelvic traction, correction of minor flex flexion deformity. This is a box traction in which there is a simple extension flex, uh, flex, uh, traction with the skin traction and a pillow is kept beneath the leg. Application is similar to the skin traction. 
If the traction is used more than 24 to 36 hours, it should be unwrapped daily for a skin inspection and then replaced. Coming to the Perkins traction used in the treatment of fractured tibia, femur or trochanter, the principle is that it is the use of skeletal traction without any external splintage. That is, there is no BB splintage, there is no thomas splintage, and it is coupled with active movement of the injured limb. Perkins showed that by encouraging the early muscular activity, stiffness of joint was prevented by extensibility of muscle by reciprocal innervation. This is how it is shown a Perkins traction, no splintage is there and direct skeletal traction is put, commonly put like the normal traction and this Simon civil lock are used which will promote active flexion and extension at the knee joint. But there is a problem that it leads to malunion and severe pain to the patient so it is not used nowadays. Coming to the Hamilton Russell traction can be seen in the ward rounds. Uh, the indication is management of the fracture of sharp top femur or uh, trochanteric, especially in the old age patient trochanter fractures when the surgery cannot be done is commonly managed with the Russell traction nowadays also. After arthroplasty operation of the hip joint, if, uh, it is uh, in earlier days. Application, below knee skin traction, fully attached to the spreader as shown in the figure and soft sling placed under the knee. So one pulley arrangements like uh, the sling, uh, the traction is from the A pulley, then the B and the distal pulley is C and again the traction from the B pulley. This is uh, the traction apparatus. It is based on the law of parallelogram. So usually three questions are asked, highlighted in this slide. Based on the law of parallelogram, the traction which is applied, force applied here is usually doubles. So it means you are putting 10 pounds here. So the acting force is 20 pounds because of the law of parallelogram. And the third is the traction is in the line of shaft of femur. So these are the three benefits of the Russell traction, Hamilton Russell traction. Tullock Brown traction is a modification of the Russell traction used with the skeletal traction and some other supportive uh, attachments like nissel plates and all. So nowadays not commonly used so we can skip this for right now. 1990 traction is important, can be seen in the ward. It is this device by oblates used in fracture femur with wounds over the posterior aspect of the thigh. If you have the posterior uh, wounds, subtrochantric or proximal third fracture femur, use both in children and adults. Here both hip and knee are flexed to 90 degree. A skeletal traction is applied through lower femur or upper tibia. And it is one of the most common traction used in triple deformity of the knee commonly seen in the TB knee. So if you are going to see this 1990 traction nowadays in the ward, it is most likely is due to the triple deformity of the knee in the TB patients. This is the apparatus, how it is put, one traction and the hip is 90, knee is 90 and there are uh, one traction directly on the knee joint uh, on the distal femur but if you are treating the triple deformity knee then this uh, pin is kept in the tibia to pull the posterior sublux tibia here and this is the another traction just to support the weight of the leg. Whereas a mangal, uh, valgus angulation at the fracture site is controlled by moving the pulleys, rotation is controlled by knee being flexed. As a union of the fracture occurs, we encourage active hip and knee exercises, upper tibial pin to be avoided in patient whose weight is more than 45 kg as it causes uh, knee laxity. Dangers, definitely those of the skeletal traction, stiffness and loss of extension of the knees, flexion contracture of the hip joint and injury to the lower femoral or upper tibial epiphyseal of the growth plate and neurovascular damage. Balance suspension with the Pearson attachment. Pearson attachment means just you are allowing the knee range of motion along with thomas traction. So this is the original Pearson uh, attachment. If you can see the Thomas splint is this and Pearson has attached like this. So it provides some degree of flexion to the knee joint and you can change the angle, the degree of this flexion as per your will. All right. So it provides early knee range of motion. So the benefit of the Pearson attachment is uh, if you want to, if you are dealing with a middle third fracture, you can keep the flexion to just 30 degree of flexion and the traction in the line of femur and if you are dealing with the distal third of the femur fracture 
then you can increase the flexion of the Pearson attachment and the knee is flexed sharply and the flexion uh, of this knee is at the fulcrum of the fracture so that the distal femur which is flexed comes in line with the proximal femur all right and what is a fixed splint so this is another question asked the difference between the Pearson and Fix Fix is nothing else the Fix uh, understood that uh, Pearson when the Pearson uh, is attached the distal part of the thomas is of no use so he detached the distal part of the thomas splint all right so uh, the distal part of the thomas splint is detached and the Fix attachment is attached like this which is a moving attachment all right so uh, and uh, sliding traction in the fixed splint the beauty of this is that the distal cut part of the thomas splint is attached with the traction which is over the head of the patient with the 2 kg of the uh, 2 kg of the weight and the patient is uh, pulling this traction weight and uh, trying to active knee and hip flexion doing on his own as shown in this figure all right so this is the hanging 2 kg weight near the head Brian strangle commonly used in the nowadays gallows traction knees are slightly flexed buttocks slightly elevated used in shaft of femur fracture in less than 2 years of age 10 to 12 kg of weight of the children child apply adhesive strapping to both the lower limb tie traction cords to an overhead beam tighten the traction uh, cord to raise the button just clear the mattress counter traction obtained by the weight of the pelvis vascular complication of the brain traction may occur in either the injured or the normal limb a careful check must be done in both the limbs during the first 24 to 72 hours by checking color and the temperature of the limb dorsiflexion of both ankle passively brain strangle under two years safe two to four years vascular complication can occur but it can be prevented if you keep the knee flexion more than 10 degrees and oh by a posterior splint and over four years it is absolutely contraindicated then it is a modified brain section used in congenital dislocation of hip modified brain section the legs are initially vertical and the hips are abducted about 10 degrees on alternate days in the initial management of cdh when diagnosis under over the age of one year after five days of abduction of the hip is started abduction is increased by 10 degree on alternate day by three weeks hip should be fully abducted all right this is bowler brown we have already discussed so uh, we are just going to discuss the advantage as we have discussed that it will allow multiple pulleys allow change of direction of the pull or the traction without changing the position of the limb can be used where, where the balkan frame facility is not available so usually nowadays it is used in the emergency setup only all right limb elevation reduces the edema so usually used in the tibial fractures the most proximal first pulley as highlighted by the arrow is usually asked in the examination what is meant for it is meant to prevent foot drop all right as seen in the figure on the right side second pulley is to apply traction in the line of the femur third pulley highlighted by the arrows to apply traction in the line of supracondylar area of the femur and high tibial traction and the fourth pulley is to apply traction in the line of the leg as in low tibial or the calcaneum traction disadvantage bowler brown frame rests on the patient bed and cannot move with the patient and it becomes bulky nursing care is more difficult movement of the proximal fracture fragment in relation with the distal fragment occurs which is cradled in the splint so it causes pain very cumbersome and this produce disposes to the deformity also so this is not recommended nowadays except for tibial fractures or emergency setups these are the various uh, traction methods uh, along for the fracture sharp femur this is just a chandler's modification the application of the thick bolster this is commonly known as chandler modification to reduce the fracture sharp femur uh, one of the last traction of the stock agnes hunt traction to correct the mild flexion deformity at the hip joint for example in cases of polio what we do is in this it eliminates the compensatory lumbar lordosis by flexing the normal hip so the normal hip is flexed and the we apply hip spica to include the lumbar spine and the normal lower limb but not the affected limb and the longitudinal traction is applied on the affected limb 
so this is a picture if you can see the hip spica is applied on the normal limb and the lumbar lordosis is obliterated and the normal longitudinal traction is applied on the affected limb this is known as agnes hunt traction lateral upper femoral traction not commonly used nowadays and the only indication is central fracture dislocation of hip and usually not used nowadays also and uh, uh, lateral femoral pain is uh, put as told earlier and the traction is applied with that this is how the bed is tilted in such scenarios uh, the diagonally opposite limbs with the low blocks one on the ipsilateral side proximally or the hand head has a high block and there is no block on the contralateral side pelvic traction is commonly used uh, special uh, harness is buckled around the patient pelvis long cords attached to the harness to the foot of the bed foot end of the bed is raised providing sliding traction and used in conservative management of pivd the answer to this question is what this pelvis traction does is to ensure that the patient lies quietly in the bed rather than to distract the vertebral bodies so it is just to ensure the bed rest not to distract the vertebral bodies this is a last traction dunlop traction i have been asked to keep it uh, if sir allow so i'll explain although the lower limb tractions are over this is the last traction which uh, can be seen in the uh, ward rounds uh, usually used in cases of supracondylar fractures in which extreme flexion can compromise the vascularity so if you can see there is a bandage wrapped on the arm and there is a traction longitudinal and bondage wrapped on the forearm and the traction is on the uh, against the cavity it is used in the management of the supracondylar and the transcondylar fractures of the humerus in the children this method is useful if flexion of the elbow cause circulatory embarrassment with loss of radial pulse so like pulseless pink hand or severe blister severe swelling in the supracondylar fracture you are going to apply this dunlop traction apply skin traction to the forearm is the patient supine abduct the shoulder 45 degree pass the traction cord over the pulley so that the elbow is flexed 45 degree so this 45 degree angle is asked in the examination place the padded sling over the distal humerus and attach one to two pounds weight to traction cord and padded sling elevate same side of the bed and check for the circulation constantly this is the figure of the dunlop traction if you can see the 45 degree of the angle the shoulder is abducted 45 degree and the forearm is flexed 45 degree so that the flexion at the uh, uh, is not too much at the elbow and the swelling can get uh, proper care nursing care all right and this is the way so this is dunlop traction and this olibron traction is a modification of this skeletal traction modification of the dunlop traction used for that and the pin is inserted in the olecranon all right it has the same indication for the supracondylar fracture as the dunlop traction put similar to the dunlop traction in a modified way so this is just a list uh, what tractions are used in which uh, scenarios so pgs and uh, pgs can just uh, mark up this list if uh, you are shown such tractions in the ward rounds and uh, disadvantage of the traction is definitely costly in terms of hospital stay prolonged bed rest related hazards like thromboembolism pneumonia decubitus ulcer contractures and it requires medical care management uh, is must care of the patient care of the traction suspension system radiographic examination is must regular check up whether the fracture is reducing or not physiotherapy is must and you should know that when to remove the traction so to avoid the complication of traction you should immobilize only those joint which are necessary to adequate immobilize the joint so use perkins or the fixed splint institute isometric exercises always have the patient perform a daily range of motion exercise program use cast brace traction like the charlie traction unit whenever possible removal of the traction continuous traction until fracture is stable and then change to another method of supporting the fracture until the union is achieved like the functional cast bracing traction is continued for elbow fractures for 3 weeks tibial fractures for 3 to 6, 6 weeks trochanteric and fracture neck of femur neck of femur uh, is usually uh, not managed with the traction but in earlier days for 6 to 12 weeks thank you